Please open your Bibles with me to Galatians 6. This will be our final week looking through the book of Galatians. Galatians 6, we'll be reading verses 11 through 18 this morning. We ask, as always, if the congregation can stand at the reading of God's Word. This is what he says. See with what large letters I am writing to you with my own hand. It is those who would want to make a good showing in the flesh who would force you to be circumcised, and only in order that they might, may not be persecuted for the cross of Christ. For even those who are circumcised do not themselves keep the law, but they desire to have you circumcised that they may boast in your flesh. But far be it from me to boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by which the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. For neither circumcision counts for anything, nor uncircumcision, but a new creation. And as for all who walk by this rule, peace and mercy be upon them and upon the Israel of God. For now on, let no one cause me trouble, for I bear on my body the marks of Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers. Amen. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, as we come to these final words of your letter to the Galatians, may we look at it once again, the situation that we've become very familiar with, and not become complacent about the very critical issue that you're putting before us, Lord. How are we to live? How are we to be saved? What is the most important thing in your eyes? Lord, open up the truths of these words today. May we not only hear them, but may we believe them, and may we live them. In your name, amen. Please have a seat. As you might expect, us pastors like nerdy Bible jokes. We're a bunch of nerds, and we like nerdy jokes, and so we often are passing around jokes to each other. I got one the other week I've actually seen several times. And the joke is that there are two types of letters that Paul writes, two types of Pauline epistles. He said the first type is the type where Paul says, we are heirs through unfathomable grace to unimaginable glory. And the second type of letter is, I am begging you as a personal favor, if you sick little weirdos keep it together for five minutes and act normal. And we laugh because it's true. Like there's some of this we hear in Galatians, Paul's pleading, right? His passion, his anger, his frustration that's coming out in this letter. And it's not the only one that he writes quite like this. But as he wraps up this letter, something very unusual happens. Normally when Paul wrote a letter, he would dictate it to a scribe. So, I don't know, who has horrible handwriting in this room? Because I'm, okay, you guys need scribes. So that's what Paul didn't have the best handwriting, presumably. And so he would dictate it to somebody whose life work was just to write something as beautifully and legibly as possible. And that's how usually he would write his, his epistles. But right now, here in verse 11, he nudges the scribe aside and says, I'm going to take over for the rest of this. This is too important, too vital to just relay through somebody else's handwriting. He says, see my big, weird letters that I'm writing for the rest of this gospel. I can only imagine people getting this letter and it looks beautiful and beautiful handwriting, and then at the end there's just this giant scribble of letters. Because he says, look how large these letters are. I want you to understand what's going on. I want you to see this so that you cannot miss the point I'm making here. Really, what's happening here in this final passage is like the closing arguments of a court case. You know, the evidence has been presented, so the lawyers get back and they get one more time, one more turn to make an argument, to make a case. And so they said, let's recap everything that's gone on, and I want to just draw to your attention the most important things, the most vital facts. So if you don't take away anything else from the letter to the Galatians, you'll take away this. Because look, I'm writing it in big, giant letters. So the bottom line, what is the bottom line for Paul? He says, bottom line, who are you? Are you a new creation? 
If you are a new creation in Christ, live as a new creation. Don't live as something old. Live as something new. Don't, a new creation isn't obsessed with pleasing other people, making themselves feel important. But rather, a new creation is always centered on the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, it's not always the case. Because not always everybody who claims to be a Christian is cross-centered. There's a lot of people who profess, will check that box on the census form. Or we'll tell somebody else if they ask, are you a Christian? Sure, I'm a Christian. But there's a big difference between somebody who professes Christ and somebody who lives the cross. A big difference. Some people may be claim to be in Jesus' camp, but really they're living an old lifestyle. They're really living nostalgia. Nostalgia is a big business these days. Have you noticed that? There are marketing arms in this country that all they do is package and sell to you nostalgia. They will, they will bring back Burger King. Have you driven by Burger King lately? They brought back the old logos, the old uh, font styles to, to capitalize on your nostalgia. Go, oh, I remember how it used to be. The Super Bowl, if you've ever watched the Super Bowl, do have you noticed like half of the commercials are all nostalgia these days? There was a couple years ago, they trotted E.T. back out. Poor E.T., he went to his home planet, they got him back. And they got the guy who played Elliot back, and they did this whole, it was like a tearjerker, of three minute little mini movie, and E.T. celebrating Christmas with Elliot and his family, and it's cute and all that. And it just kind of look. This, the nostalgia is huge for us. Sometimes we look at where we're at now and we go, man, this is tough. But back then, it was, it was sunshine and roses and we never remember the hard things. We only remember the best things. And sometimes we get so obsessed with the past that we wish we could go back. We wish we could live back the way things used to be. Well, nostalgia may be attractive, but let's not get overly fond of how our lives used to be before we had Christ. Because that's really the problem with the false teachers. We've been looking at the false teachers all throughout the book of Galatians. Their problem is they're stuck in the past. They, as things are changing around them, the cross has changed everything. Gospel has changed everything. They want to go back. They are terrified of the way things are changing to be. And they're probably offended by the new message of the gospel. This has really pulled the rug right out from under them. They knew how things used to be. There were rules. There was a checklist. You got circumcised. That's a way you knew you were part of God's kingdom. And now it's something different. A lot of people get offended by the gospel, especially when you really lay it out to them and they clearly understand it for the first time. Some people will respond with horror in their face. The gospel tells you, you are weak. You are incapable of self-saving. You need Jesus. You are not a naturally good person, but rather you are riddled with sin. Sin that you cannot absolve yourself by doing no matter how many good deeds you might in your life. Well, the Judaizers here are offended by the gospel. And Paul, in turn, in his closing arguments, shines a spotlight back on these guys. Just in case, he tells the Galatians, just in case you were starting to feel sorry for them, we're starting to go back into their camp. Let's just sum up who these people are. Verses 12 and 13. He says, these people are false teachers who manipulate other people. They compromise on the gospel. They act hypocritically all the time. And they're arrogant show-offs. They want everybody to look at who they are. Look at me. Look how great I am. Look how wise and how circumcised I am. And these people... These false teachers are absolutely offended by the gospel because the gospel says the door's wide open. Now Jew and Gentile are both coming in. Whether they're circumcised or uncircumcised, whether they followed all the laws of the Old Testament or only now are being saved, they are welcomed into Christ's kingdom. They're all under one tent, one umbrella, and they're receiving the same inheritance. That is offensive to them. Overnight, they saw their, their rules and their checklists torn up. Their world turned upside down, and they're fighting against that. What they should be doing is submitting to the cross. 
It should be bowing down with the rest of the Galatians, going, Lord, I am a sinner. I am a man of unclean lips, as Jeremiah says. Have mercy upon me. But no, they want to keep on following laws to make themselves look good. They want to force other people, non-Jews, to become Jewish just so that they're more comfortable and they can look like they're the best in the room. They want to coast to salvation on the backs of other people. The call of the cross can be at the same time one of the most exhilarating things in the world and one of the most terrifying. And I think if we've really come to the cross, we understand both dimensions of that. It can be both exciting and scary at the same time, a ball of that mixed together. Because the new creation that God is calling us to be through the cross puts to death the person you used to be. Puts to death your old ways, your old sin, your old lifestyle, the way you thought the world used to be, the way you used to think you were a good person, the way you went about in, in rather ignorance of the truth. It puts to death that and creates in you a new creation and says now you are going to live a new path, a new way, as a new being who is made new by my blood in the covenant. Well, sometimes we have a hard time with that. Some people hear those words, and they run for the hills. And other people, even as Christians, we might hear the words and be called to this new creation. But now and then, like the Galatians, we might find our nostalgia perking up. We might look back and go, wasn't it so much easier back then? Back when I was partially blind to the truth of everything? I want, maybe I do want to go back when I could just sin with impunity. And live the way I used to live, where I can be my own God, really. But that's not what the new creation is called to do. The new creation is not scared of the cross of Jesus Christ. It clings to it. It says, shape me, mold me, make me, lead me. I want to be you, not what I used to be. The great preacher Charles Spurgeon once said, that out of all the things Paul ever wrote, if you wanted to look for his one mission statement, it's right here in Galatians chapter 6, verse 14. Out of everything Paul wrote, he says right here is the central point of Paul. He says this, Far be it from me to boast, except to boast in the cross of Jesus Christ. Now, Paul, the language I wish we could all understand and read Greek, because the language he's using here in Greek is the strongest possible negative that the Greek language has to offer. Far be it from me. It sounds almost, you know, like casual. He's saying, forbid it that I ever boast in anything else in the rest of my life except the cross. There shouldn't be a word that comes out of my mouth to praise myself, to praise anything that I am, that I've done, that I will do, to praise anything else in the entire world except the cross of Jesus Christ. That is the only thing that matters. Because for Paul, he lives a cross-centered life. Everything he is is about the cross. And the gospel is tied up in that. And to outsiders, that may seem like one of the most strange things that ever is uttered. If nobody's ever heard of the Bible and the cross, and you go up to them and say, I boast in the cross of Jesus Christ, they might have this look on their face like, what? Like that would be like us boasting in the electric chair. Do you boast in medieval torture chambers? What kind of demented person are you? I would bet that maybe a third, maybe a half of you right now are wearing a cross somewhere on your body. Maybe you have uh, earrings or a tattoo or a necklace, and you have a cross on you. Have you ever really thought about what that means to an outsider? Do you wearing a symbol that used to mean humiliation? It used to mean the most agonizing death ever created to execute people. It meant shame. It meant a curse. That's the symbol of the cross, except when Jesus died on the cross, suddenly it changed that symbol to life, to victory, to resurrection. And that's why we as Christians carry that cross and we boast in it. It's not because it's trendy. 
It's not because the cross makes us look nice, but it's because of what it now represents through the one particular cross. But don't take your eyes off the fact that it was, it's this, the cross means something because of how, amazing, how horrible it used to be. Today is Palm Sunday. Today is the day where we shout Hosanna. We remember that amazing day when Jesus rode in on the back of a donkey and the crowds came out and they had a parade and they were throwing down palm leaves and they were throwing down their cloaks and they were chanting to Jesus. They were ushering a king into Jerusalem. But they didn't see the truth of what was happening. Because a week before Palm Sunday, Jesus called his apostles around him and said, we're going to Jerusalem, and there I will be crucified on a cross. And can you imagine the horror on the faces of the apostles as that really sank in? Peter stood up and said, forbid it, forbid it. I'm not going to let this happen. Impulsive, headstrong Peter. Jesus, I'll take a bullet for you, but there's no way I'm going to let you go to Jerusalem. Jesus says, get behind me, Satan. This has to happen. And scriptures tell us that a week before then, Jesus set his face like a flint toward Jerusalem. He made it his mission that he was going to get into that city. He was going to walk to the cross. He was going to stretch out his arms, and he was going to die. Because if he did not, we were lost. If he did not, we would have no hope. If he did not, there would be no redemption, no salvation, no forgiveness. The people he loved would burn in hell forever. And so he set his face like a flint. And he said, get behind me because I'm doing this. Because I love those people and I love you guys. That is what the cross means. The cross is the best and the only thing we should boast about in our lives if we're going to boast about something. We often boast about smaller things. Just think about how we boast about good things that happen in our life. That's okay. Share something good. Share your praises. Make them into blessings. You, you get overly excited about small things that you think might make your life a little bit better. Maybe you get a good tax return or a good news from the doctor or, or a, a law gets passed that you think is going to make all of life better. Paul says, all of that small stuff, the big thing happened 2,000 years ago. That's what we should be boasting about every single day. And if you go back through the book of Galatians, and that's my challenge to you this week, reread this book. But reread it from the perspective of, look how Paul is boasting in the cross of Jesus Christ. Because he does it again and again and again. Chapter 1, he boasts that the cross frees us from the current evil age. You want to be free of this evil age? This age that every day you turn on the news, and you feel like, man, I'm depressed. It's horrible thing after horrible thing. This world is going to hell in a handbasket. I hate it. He says the cross frees you from that. It shows you victory. It shows you amazing, amazing grace. Chapter 3, Paul boasts that the cross unleashes the spirit in our lives, brings the blessing of, of Abraham into us. Chapter 4, he boasts that the cross allows us to be adopted as heirs along with Jesus Christ, gives us a better freedom than we've ever had in our life. Again and again, Paul boasts of the cross because that's what a new creation does. You get saved, you get transformed. All you want to talk about is what just happened to you. Let me tell you about this story. Let me tell you about my life. And when somebody looks at you and sees a radically transformed person, and they'll go up to you like, what's your secret? How have you become like this? Well, now you have a story to tell them. In his own heavy handwriting, Paul writes these final sentences. He says, all that matters is being a new creation forged in the cross. He says, I've died to the way I used to be. I've died to the world, he says. The world's been crucified to me, and I've been crucified to the world. We no longer are on speaking terms. I no longer care if the world approves of me. I'm no longer scared by the world. I live for Jesus. That's all I'm, uh, all I'm concentrating on. He says, I'm going to do that even if it gets me beaten, even if it gets me whipped, even if it gets me killed. 
The other day, Ellie fell down. Well, she jumped. Jumped off a stage, right? And, and hurt her hand. She came home and she showed us how she had, 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 a, had a, a bleeding mark on her hand. I was a little bit worried that, you know, what's going to leave a scar? And I said, honey, scars are cool. Like, they are cool because they're a story of what's happened to our body. And maybe some of those scars are embarrassing stories that you don't want anybody to know. You know, how did you get that scar? Well, I thought I was Superman once and jumped off a roof, and that wasn't a good idea, right? Sometimes the scars are a mark of pain, a surgery you went through, so, something that you might have done to, to help somebody else, but you got scarred in the process. Well, for Paul, his marks of Jesus, as he says here, the scars that he bears are stigmata. Stigmata is a brand. Usually they use to brand slaves, to say, you're going to be a slave forever. You're my property. Here's the brand I put on you, the stigmata that shows you you are now my property. And Paul says, this stigmata, the scars that I bear, are a sign that I belong to him. I'm his property. I'm who he wants me to be. If you take up your cross to follow Jesus Christ, you're going to get scars. Some of those scars maybe, maybe will be visible, physical scars. A lot of them won't be. A lot of them will be hurts, barbs that other people will throw at you, mockery, shame that people will make you, try to make you feel. Maybe it will be a separation of a friendship or rift in your family because now you're following a different way. You'll bear these scars. But you can't get those scars if you only merely profess to be a Christian and are too scared to take up the cross. When you bear those scars, you know you have taken up the cross for Jesus Christ. Well, have you ever had a conversation with somebody who started a new diet or a new exercise regime and they're almost way too excited to tell you all about it? And it's almost, always the same thing. They'll tell you, well, it was really tough at first. But then I got through it, and now there's all these amazing benefits. I've had this, this juice cleanse, and you know, I was sweating orange for a while. That was weird, but now great benefits on my body. I've taken up kickboxing, a Mediterranean diet. I run 16 miles into work every day. It's great. Look how amazing I, I look. Or maybe you encounter somebody, and you haven't seen them for a while, and there's just been a huge physical or just a, a change about them that you know. And you ask them, what's your secret? What's your secret? How do you look this good? How do you look this awesome? And they'll tell you, because who wouldn't tell you? We're, ex we're like waiting for somebody to ask us. And, and we, we want to share that. And so that's like that when we have a new creation in us. Nobody was begging the Judaizers, by the way, to share their secret. Everybody already knew. They were following the same old, same old nostalgia that they had been doing for years. The same old thing that hadn't been working for them. They wanted to try to follow the rules as if the rules could save them. How's that been working out? Not that good. Because they can't do it. Nobody's been able to do it. For thousands and thousands of years. So nobody was asking the Judaizers, what's your secret? Tell me. Share that secret so that I can have it too. But I'll tell you what, people were asking Paul. They were asking Barnabas. They were asking these new Christians who had the Holy Spirit in them, what's your secret? How do you have this much power in prayer? How are you able to, to go from people who can barely speak in public to now you're sharing these amazing words of authority and testimony? What's your secret? And time again, they turn around and say, my secret is it's not a secret at all. It's the cross. I'm living the cross. The cross changed me. The cross shaped me. When people ask us, we are given this amazing opportunity to say the same thing. It's not about me. You're expecting me to share that with you. That it was something I created, that I had this amazing willpower, that I changed my life through a 12-step plan. No. It's all about a God-man who set his face like a flint and went and was crucified that he could clear a path that I could be saved, I could be forgiven, I could be given grace, and I could be given the Holy Spirit. That's what's changed me. And you can have it too. Because Jesus is not withholding it from anybody 
who wants it. On Good Friday, the disciples thought the cross was the end of everything. That was it. Their rabbi, their Messiah was dying, bleeding, gasping, screaming, pleading his last as he gave up his spirit to God. They thought that was the end. They took his body down. They wept. They brought him to a tomb. That was the end. And so for the, for the rest of their lives, they knew whenever they'd see another cross, they would think, man, those were the days we had with Jesus, weren't they? That was a great run we had. And now it's over. And maybe we'll end up on one of those crosses too. But on Easter Sunday, the cross changed. And from being the end of something, it began to be the beginning of something, of new life, of a new creation, of a reason to celebrate, of a reason to say, as we have today, this cross is empty because he is not dead. He is risen, and we celebrate a risen God. And that is a reason to boast. Paul wrote in verse 16, for all who walk by the standard of this gospel, by this rule, Peace and mercy are theirs. You can't have peace with God, and you can't have the mercy of his grace unless you have the cross. But when you have the cross, you have peace, and you have mercy, and you have that knowledge that no matter whatever happens to you in your life, that will never be taken away from you. You will have that peace and that mercy now and forever. I would love to know how the Galatians received this letter. I would love to know what their response was. Did they change their ways? Did they give those Judaizers the boot out of the church and say, we got to reform this church? we got to get back to the gospel? Was it a relief for them to, to read these words? Were they convicted? We don't know. But I think the most more important question to ask is how do we respond to the book of Galatians? How do we receive this letter? Is it powerful encouragement to us today as new creations of Jesus Christ? Or do we reject it and say, I just want to keep living my old life. I want to keep on doing what I'm doing. Cling to the cross. Cling to the one who says in Revelation 21, verse 5, Behold, I am making all things new. That includes you. He can make you new. And if you are new in him, don't surrender that. Don't give it up. Don't go back. Don't become a legalist. Live in grace. Live in that freedom. May God bless us for this book he's given to us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, the cross means so much, and yet we look at it so little. May we just come to the foot of the cross with awe, with reverence, with love, with appreciation for what you have done. Lord, without it, we would be, we'd be lost. We'd be hopeless. We'd be doing everything we're doing right now for nothing. But Lord, because of what you have done, we know one day we will wake up. We will be in heaven. We will be with you, with love. We will be with our family. We will be in a joy everlasting where there will be no more pain, and no more sorrow. There will be simply peace and mercy upon us forever. Lord, we cannot love you enough for that in your name. Amen. If you would like an elder to pray over you after the service, come up. We'd love to do that. Maybe you're questioning if you've ever been saved before. You want to let us lead you through that prayer. Come up, and we'd love to be able to lead you through that. I also want to welcome Stuart back from his month-long trip overseas. Got in late last night, and he's powering through this morning, so thank you very much, Stu. Now receive the benediction from, appropriately, the book of Galatians. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with your spirit, brothers and sisters. Amen. Amen. Go in peace. Do you know Jesus as your Lord and Savior? If not, 
please click the link in the upper right hand corner to view our message, the most important video you will ever watch. Join us for worship Sunday mornings at 10.30 a.m., either in person at 2595 Elmwood Avenue in Kenmore, New York, or on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash KNOXEPC. Find past sermons on our website knoxepc.com forward slash sermons. Stay up to date with Knox Church. To receive our monthly newsletter, email office at knoxepc.com. If you need prayer, send an email to pastor at knoxepc.com. You can request text alerts by texting 734-968-1847. Knox Sunday School happens every Sunday at 9 a.m. for kids grades kindergarten through 8th, and for adults of all ages. Email office at knoxepc.com for more information. Knox Evangelical Presbyterian Church. Our motto is truthful teaching, and graceful living. We are committed to growing in the knowledge of Jesus, serving Him by serving others, and loving the body of Christ. To donate to Knox Church via PayPal, visit knoxepc.com and click on giving at the top of the page, or scan the QR code above with your smartphone or tablet. Special thanks to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the members of Knox Church. Without them, this outreach wouldn't be possible.